My name is Tomas Singh. That is the name that has been handed down to me from my father. He was also carrying that name, Tomas Singh. And it's actually a place name. It's one of the Gulf Islands that are around here. And that name comes from Kwasainich. And that is my father's ancestry is Kwasainich. My mother's ancestry is Lekwanen. And I also use the name Chaz. It's a more of a nickname. My real name is Charles. Well, not real, but my uh, colonial legal name is Charles. I participated in Nick Claxton's making of a reef net at our local tribal school. So I got to get a little taste of what it takes to make a reef net with the tools that we have nowadays. But something that I really wanted to do was use the resources that we had used to make the reef net in my grandparents' time, my great grandparents' time. First thing I uh, struck me was the escape of the reef net. That always just kind of struck me as something that was so important, the act of conservation. So uh, off the bat, I knew right away that's what my focus was going to be directed towards, was that escape. We purposely put a escape hole within these reef nets so the fish could carry on their life. And the escape itself is called salish, which translates to life. And to me, that was the most important aspect of this whole net. It fed not only us, but it fed our children for years to come and it continued on life for them as well. They could return home back to their streams as that stuck out to me and it's, that's something that needs to be looked at. And today when there's no active conservation in any type of harvesting that's being done, that's something that I really wanted to draw attention to is the lack of conservation. By giving an example of conservation, I had a lot of visits with my uncle, my uncle John Elliot. He's a, a language carrier and he also carries a lot of history. He just lives down the street, so I could just go down the road and go sit with him and go pick at his mind for a bit. I did that for a good a good month. I would go sit down there with my uncle and learn what the process was to make a piece of net, because that's something that I knew that I wanted to incorporate in this carving here. The actual carving had come to me in my head. I just saw the whole thing. Once I had the idea of what I was going to do, I had it all drawn out. The sap wasn't quite running on the willow bark when I had first drawn this up. So it was kind of a waiting time. So I, I did the carving part in the meantime. And once it became harvest season, that's when I got my uh, few of my family members to come help me. Where we actually harvested the willow bark was over by what is known as Durant's Lake now. That's where we uh, harvested most of our willow bark we used for this project and also as well as my uncle's property. We uh, had a good few days of just uh, separating. It's the inner bark which is used. So we separated the outer from the inner bark and that, that took a, a good couple a week, I would say, a good week of all the material that we gathered and separating them. So we actually soaked that bark once we got it home. It helped, I found, to remove the inner from the outer bark. Cutting those strips into the widths, right widths, to make the rope, we wanted it, the rope to be consistent. We started slicing the bark into uh, equal strips, and it was then when I could call on most of my family to come help me twine these strands into rope. My brother, Matt Elliott, he's one I have to really be thankful to. He helped me harvest almost every single willow bark that was used in this willow net. It's 64 feet of rope before I could make a two foot square of this net. So that gives you an idea of how much actual time was put into these big nets. I was taught that there was uh, family members that would have to have a certain amount done before it became reef netting season. And I can only imagine like how much uh, work they had put into that before the nets became conjoined between the multiple families. That was humbling to say the least. So that was the process of making the rope, not the net. So once I had 64 feet of rope, then I could bring the net together. So the carving here, it's all done in the Salish designing system. I was handed down the Salish designing system from my father and ancestors. So the outside of this, Whole carving. This is a red cedar rope. Me and my brother made that, my brother Matt, and we um, decided to put that on there as a finish because of the lead lines that would go down the whole. The background of the carving with these are all salmon. I didn't want to make them the same. Nothing in nature is perfect or the same. So each of these salmon are a little bit different from each other. And these are the salmon that were going to be caught by the people and uh, I wanted to have a contrast from the salmon escaping. That's why I chose to use two different types of cedar. Yellow cedar is the fish that are being captured and red cedar is the fish that is escaping. So this big, huge two foot yellow cedar round flat disc here is actually multiple 
yellow cedar boards that we had laminated, me and my brother. It's super hard and difficult to find old growth yellow cedar and anything large around because it's being so deforested throughout time. And old growth is what we mainly carve. So this right here, this hoop, I shall call it, is my interpretation of the Salish, which translates to life. This is the escaping salmon coming outwards of this carving. And he's gonna, or she, returning back to the river where they would spawn and create more life generations to come. The salmon head here actually has a different texture the head itself, the face of the salmon, it's quite hard compared to the scales behind its head running along its body. So this is all knifed on the back of its head. Anything after the gill here, it's all knife. It's all single knife knife. And this is a uh, this is actually sanded. I wanted to create that contrast of an actual salmon. So this uh, salmon head here is actually attached with a uh, dowel. I uh, remember technique that my woodshop teacher showed me how to make a really nice flush piece of wood attached to another piece of wood using a dowel. So that's how this uh, head is attached and I did add some epoxy glue. I tried to keep this whole thing natural so apart from the glues on here this whole project everything is basically chemical free. So the eyes are silver inlay and that was a decision between abalone and silver inlay for the eye. The color abalone it's it's ready it's, it's mixed with purples and silvers and it almost looks like an actual fish that is uh, in fresh water when they return home to spawn and they start to change their color and they're on their way out of this life. I gotta thank um, brother, my brother Ishwa for helping me decide that because he, he's the one who pointed that out to me. I'm very appreciative of this exhibition that's going on here, so thank you Legacy Art Gallery. It's a wicked idea you guys have going on here. I think it's very important for a lot of different people who live in this area and visitors to see the acts of conservation in this exhibition. And I'd also like to thank my uncle John Elliott, Auntie Lindy Elliott, my mom, Myrna Elliott, my father, Charles Elliott, my brother and sister, Matt and Cedar Elliott. They all helped me along this project and I have a lot of other Saanich, Quisanich brothers that I'd love to thank for helping me along this project from start to finish. Hi, Scott, see you.